Bambino, I think it's Spanish. Oh, I don't know. It could be Italian. <coughs> anyway, whatever. It's Italian. Okay, Italian. Okay. All right. The birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus has been foretold for centuries before it ever occurred. It was always in God's upper story plan. It wasn't something that was new. God had spoken to Adam and Eve to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. He had spoken to King David. And in each of the times that he had spoken, there had been a promise that God's people would be in a land and that God would bring forth a Redeemer in that land that would be His special spokesman that would be called Messiah, Adonai, the Anointed One, or Christ, the Anointed One. And He would be the one that would bring salvation, not only to Israel, but to the world. When God spoke to King Solomon, he told Solomon that if you will be obedient and obey me, then I will continue your line and David, your father's line, forever. But Solomon did something that had been prophesied years before by Moses. Moses had said, when you enter into the promised land, when you enter into that land where God has chosen to put His name, you will ask for a king. And when you ask for a king, that king is not to go to Egypt to gather horses for warfare. That king is not to multiply for himself wives who will turn his heart from God. And that king is not to multiply for himself riches. That king is to write for himself a copy of this law so that he can read it and study it daily and can rule as God would have him to rule. When King Solomon came to the throne, his father David had conquered all of the lands. David was a man of war. Solomon lived in a time of peace. The peace that his father had brought about for his son to rule. David had prepared everything that was needed for Solomon to rule and to build the temple. Yet, Solomon, as we saw last week, went to Egypt and married the daughter of the Pharaoh. Not only did he marry the daughter of the Pharaoh, but he married 700 other royal wives. And his wives turned his heart from fully, fully worshiping God the way his father David had done. And God says to Solomon, Because you have turned your heart from wholly worshiping me and honoring me, I am going to take the kingdom that you have been ruling and I am going to take it 
from you. I am going to give it to one of your servants, a man by the name of Jeroboam. And I am going to give him ten of the twelve tribes of Israel. And you, Solomon, are going to be left, or your son, Solomon, is going to be left with only one tribe. The tribe of Judah. Now, if you heard me correctly, you heard me say ten tribes and twelve tribes, and, 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 and one tribe, okay? But what happens here is that the tribe of Benjamin, which was the smallest of all of the tribes of Israel, was the tribe of Benjamin was right next to the tribe of Judah, and it becomes subsumed into the tribe of Judah. Okay, so Benjamin, who is the youngest of the sons, becomes a part of the tribe of Judah. Solomon is told... You have not been faithful to me. But because of your father David, there is going to be one tribe, the tribe of Judah, that is going to be my tribe, my people. For it is from Judah that the promised one is going to come. God also sends a prophet to Jeroboam. And he says to Jeroboam, you are going to become king of ten of the tribes of God. Ten of the tribes of the children of Israel. You are going to unite them and they are going to follow you. Because God has taken the kingdom away from Solomon. And God says to you, Jeroboam, if you will be faithful and follow me in all of your life, if your heart will be totally dedicated to me as David's heart was, then I will establish for you, God says, a kingdom like that of David. You will be able to have ancestor or uh, descendants that are following you, and I will establish for you a great kingdom. If you will only have your heart totally dedicated to me. Jeroboam seeks to lead in a rebellion before his time. And Solomon attempts to kill him, and Jeroboam flees to what country? Egypt. When Solomon dies, his son, Rehoboam, becomes king, is anointed the king. And Rehoboam is faced with a group of people led by Jeroboam who is representing the ten tribes of Israel and they say to Rehoboam, Rehoboam, you are now king. We will follow you and we will be your servants if you will remove the burden that your father placed upon us. You see, when Israel asked for a king to rule over them, Samuel was very disturbed because he felt that Israel had rejected him and God said to Samuel, no, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They have rejected. And now they are on a slippery slope that is going to be continually descending because they have rejected me as king. Samuel had told the people when God, when they asked for a king, that, these, that this king is going to take your 
sons and your daughters and they, he is going to make them serve him. He is going to tax you and he's going to take your money and he's going to make your life miserable. And that's exactly what Solomon did. And the people were ready to rebel against Solomon because of his taxations. Because of his using of their children for his benefit. And not for God's. And so, Jeroboam and the people speak to Rehoboam and say, Rehoboam, we will serve you forever. We will be faithful to you forever if you will only reduce the taxation burdens and give us back our children. spent his three days talking to advisors. He went to the elders, to the elders that had served his father so faithfully and so well. And he said to the elders, these people of Israel, these northern people led by Jeroboam, have said to me that if you will reduce our taxation, if you will reduce the burdens that your father laid upon us, they will serve you faithfully. And the elder said, yes, do it. Be wise. Do it. They will follow you. They have said they will follow you. Trust them. Because it will be to your benefit. But then Rehoboam went to his friends, his peers, the young men that he had grown up with, the young men that had eaten at the table of his father, the young men that had benefited from being with uh, Rehoboam as he was growing up and as he was coming to power. And here are these young men and, and, and they've got it good. And you know what? They want it better. They weren't satisfied with all that they had. They weren't satisfied with the things that they had been provided, that God had provided for them. And they said to Rehoboam, he, they said, Rehoboam, you go tell the people that your little finger is bigger than your father's waist. And that you are going to treat them more harshly than your father did. That rather than being whipped with whips, you're going to scourge them. What a way to get people to follow you. <laughs> and so, as we know the story, Rehoboam took the advice of his friends and not the advice of the elders, and the kingdom was torn from his hands. The twelve tribes in the north started uh, just slightly toward north of where Jerusalem is, up uh, uh, and, and uh, north of there, uh, and went all the way up. The whole mighty kingdom, all of the children of Israel, were now a kingdom of Israel divided from the kingdom of Judah in the south. And so civil war was about to break out. It's very interesting, one of the things that you, that you find here in this story.
that as the Civil War was about to break out, God said to the people of Judah, to the 180,000 fighting, fighting men of Judah that was fixing to go up and defend Rehoboam and try to retake the kingdom and to destroy Israel and to, uh, to destroy uh, Jeroboam and to get Israel, the 12, the 10 tribes to follow Rehoboam. It's very interesting if you look on the bottom of page 195 in the book. The word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God. Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all of Judah and Benjamin and to the rest of the people, this is what the Lord says. Do not go up to fight against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my duty. Civil war was about to break out, and God speaks and says, Stop! This is my doing. I am still in control. And wonder of wonders, all of the people went home. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again as the Lord had ordered. It's the only time in history that I know that they really obeyed the Lord. Have you thought about that? Here they are, ready to go to war. And God says, stop. I'm in control. I have brought this about because, and He doesn't say it here, but because of the sins of your father Solomon, because of the sins of that he committed and his heart was turned away from God, I have brought this about. Now go home. And they all said, Aye, aye, sir. And went home. There was no civil war. There was no mass killings. Now, Jeroboam has been told that he is to remain faithful to God. That God is doing this thing and that if he, Jeroboam, will be faithful to God, he will have descendants that are going to rule Israel. But what does Jeroboam do? Jeroboam thinks on the earthly plane, on the earthly story, on his story. And he's thinking, wait a minute, I'm now king over all of these people, and the only place that they can worship is here in Jerusalem, in the temple, and at the altar. So if I let all of my people go to Judah, to Jerusalem to worship, they're going to become and remain faithful to God, and they're going to politically become allied again with Judah. I've got to do something about this. So he thinks, aha, I know what I'll do. I'll go to Bethel. Remember Bethel, the house of God? The place where Jacob had met God, where he had seen God and the angels ascending and descending from heaven? He went Jeroboam goes to Bethel and he goes up to the northern city of Dan and there he erects two idols. Two golden calves. You remember the golden calf? The children of Israel come out of the promised land. They're at Mount Sinai. Moses is up on the mountain and there while he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights, the people get 
a little uh, disturbed and, and they don't know what to do, so they go to Aaron and what does Aaron do? Gathers all of the gold, throws it into the fire, and out comes what? A <laughs> golden calf. That's exactly what he said to Moses. He said, I threw the gold in the fire and it came out. Yeah, okay. And Jeroboam says to the people, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Worship them. Immediately, he turns from God and he starts appointing priests that were not from the Levitical priesthood. Anybody who wanted to be a preacher or a priest or a pastor or a prophet or whatever, anybody who wanted it, it didn't matter who they were, Jeroboam appointed them to be a priest. And because he did that, God says, you are going to lose your kingdom. You have not been faithful to me. And God says, through a man of God, that a son named Josiah is going to be born to the house of David who is going to come and destroy these two places of worship that you have set. Rehoboam also sets up high places for the people to go worship at. Rehoboam does not remain faithful to God. And there's a whole much more in here about the story. But as we look at the lower story and as we look at mankind, we see that men have a tendency to rebel. We have see that men have a tendency to turn to their own wicked ways. After Jeroboam becomes king, there are approximately 14, 15, maybe 20 other kings that follow him. And every one of them do evil in the sight of God. After Rehoboam becomes king, there are only six kings of Judah that are given and described as being truly following God. Every other king, both from the kings of Israel in the north and the kings of Judah to the south, only six truly followed God. Only six were called good by God. Because it is in man's nature to rebel and to seek their own good. Rehoboam allowed idols to be placed in different places. Rehoboam and his people began to worship the gods of the people around him. And so Rehoboam is going to be destroyed by God. But God is going to remain faithful to the promises that he made from the time of Adam through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and David. God is going to be faithful to his promises and there is going to come one from the tribe of Judah that is going to be the king, not of Israel, not of Judah, but the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the spokesman like Moses who is going to speak the very words of God, and those who hear His words and follow Him are going to become the people of God. The kingdom is torn apart. 
The United King have, Kingdom has now become the divided kingdom because of men's rebellion against each other and primarily because of man's rebellion against God. But God remains faithful to His promises. And God remains faithful to those who follow Him. For He says, if you follow Me, if your heart is committed to Me, then I will bless you. And if you turn from Me, then I will curse you. You and I today are living in a lower story. Each one of us has trials and tribulations and problems that we are faced with in life. And God has called us to look to Him and to follow Him. And He will take care and He will provide for us. He is faithful to His promises. And He calls us to be faithful to Him. And to renew each day our commitment to Him in obedience and in love. We're going to... Father, we thank You for Your faithfulness. We thank You for the promises that You made to Your, to your people so many years ago and that You have made to us. Thank You, Father, that we can trust You and know that You will fulfill the promises that You have made to us because of our acceptance of Your Son, Jesus as our Lord and as our Master. For it is in His name we pray.